Welcome to episode 2 of my Clockwork Empires Revision 40 uh, playthrough and uh, talk over and whatever this is where I talk about new stuff and old stuff and uh, generally drown out the game sounds with my voice. Um, this is actually part 2 of session 1, uh, confusingly, which means basically my first session just went on way too long and I cut it in half. And so this is part 2 of that. Um, in this one I talk about... Uh, well, game mechanics, as always, um, and branching decision trees, and uh, interactions with the NPCs. Uh, yeah, so I hope you enjoy this one. So, uh, while we wait for this to get done, um, what did I talk about? Uh, I talked about the filthy foreigners. Um, let's see. There's, there's been a whole bunch of new stuff, and a lot of the new things are things that are not immediately visible, uh, but they are important to the game. Like, the game is so much more stable now than than it's been in a long time. I believe one of the one of the things the the guys at Gaslamp Games fo have been focusing on for the last couple of revisions is stability, and uh, specifically things like data structures and the way jobs are handled by the engine and when everything works perfectly you don't notice it right it's like that thing they talk about uh how do you know how do you know special effects uh when you're talking about movies how do you know special effects or the soundtrack are doing their job you don't notice them and they just contribute to the functioning of the movie or in the, so in this case um the game runs so much more smoothly than it used to and it hardly ever crashes. And little things like, it is now possible to save the game. And later on, saves will not crash the game. And later still after that, saves will not corrupt the state of the game so that the game remains playable after you load a save. After all that stuff is working, which for the most part it is, um, you stop noticing it. And you know, we should still appreciate things like that is what I'm saying. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so one of the reasons it's important to build a kitchen is um, see this barrel, bushel, bushel of lingamaries? If a colony eats it, eats one bushel and it's gone. If, however, the kitchen is allowed to cook whatever, say this bushel of lingonberries, it can turn up this specific food item into a crate of lingonberry preserves and turns one raw bird into cooked bird. But it's always a multiple. So for meat products, it's the output is actually triple. One raw bird produces three cooked birds. And for veggies, it's double. So there's one bushel will produce two crates, and in each of which is a meal. So it multiplies the available amount of food. And of course, it's food, or it's cooked food, which means your colonists are happy to eat it, or at least not sad that they have to eat raw food. And those are your concerns, you know, immediately on um, you know, establishing a new colony. Uh, listen to me nattering on and neglecting the upkeep of my colony. So if you look in the bottom right here, um, this is uh, one of the spontaneous events, the fish person sighting. A specific colonist has a s reports uh, sighting a strange fishy looking creature. It's a fish man. Um, it's this horrible scaly thing that walks like a man. And um, so I have the, op how am I gonna deal with this? So uh, I can just deny that they exist and refuse to interact with them. I can uh, react aggressively, just shoot at them and have my soldiers attack them at every opportunity or treat them, uh, tolerate them and maybe try to communicate with them. I'm gonna take option three here. Prior to the introduction of the sort of fishman interaction features, fishmen are just, fishmen used to be just always hostile and they were uh, in the parlance of the developers, they were the game's goblins. They would just rush in to your town um, 
in intervals and just wreck everything until they were all dead. Uh, there's so much more nuance now. Um, you can try to maintain friendly relations with them, and they, uh, you know, you don't share the same language, right? They don't understand farming, so they're always walking all over your cabbage. Uh, but they'll sometimes bring you gifts from the deeps of the sea, which are sometimes cool, like baskets of scrap iron, which are useful for making metal tools, or baskets of bones, um, which might not be as useful, or cubes of meat. That's a new resource that was introduced. Uh, I don't think they're usable yet. You can't cook them or anything. They're just disturbing cubes of meat of uh, the size of bread boxes of unknown origin. Now, one... Uh, ooh, favor time. I've got three prestige. I think I'm okay for food. Can't afford some of these, so they're grayed out. Um, okay, I'm going to take the three extra criminals option. And then... Um, so a spontaneous event. A fellow is offering me goods that happen to fall off the back of a zeppelin. No questions asked. I can accept them, and it's free stuff, but they're shady. I can refuse them and not get the stuff, and then my prestige is not hurt. So I think I'm okay for resources now. for now. I'm going to say thanks, but no thanks. Uh, you know, go away. If I had taken them, um, there's a possibility I might trigger an investigation from the ministry, where an accountant says, hey, wait a second, somehow you have more stuff than we expect you would have. And then that leads to another branching decision. I can shoot the guy. I can shoot the uh, stoolie, which means literally killing one of my colonists. Or I can say, oh, go ahead, um, investigate all you like. Uh, if I accept the investigation, there's a possibility the investigator will find nothing because I've, whatever, it's, I've hidden it really well or, you know, he's sloppy. Or he discovers the surplus which means um, if his investigation finds evidence of wrongdoing, I am penalized, uh, prestige. If he finds nothing, well, I got away with stuff and I suffer no penalty. Um, another example of the branching decision tree. Uh, new stuff, new stuff. So the way mine shafts work is changed. So it used to be you'd plunk them down somewhere and they would, um, they would just mine. They would just, mine up a random stuff of every description every single mineral plus like stuff like peat and clay and uh, sand uh, they no longer work that way mine shafts now produce ores depending on where you put them so underneath the visible layer of the world basically there are clusters of nodes you won't know those locations unless you have a naturalist or your you're lucky enough to have a no visible on the surface like I happen to have here. So naturalists have a more specific use now. See these red and brown clumpies? Uh, these are hematite nodes and they produce uh, hematite ore which can be refined into iron which is useful for all sorts of things. Um, now it doesn't... If I build a mineshaft in the vicinity of the ore nodes here, um, that mineshaft will produce hematite as well as some amount of like sand um, and possibly clay. If I stuck it out, whatever, like out here, let's say, with no survey markers, um, I don't know what it would produce. It might not produce anything or just sand or useless crud. Um, so that's quite, it makes, uh, in my previous playthroughs, I played through this revision a little bit before, prior to, uh, oh, here's another one. These are lumps of coal, so a, a mine over here would produce coal. It means you can't just arbitrarily plunk down a mine shaft anywhere, which is what I would do. Now um, it's very important that I search out specific minerals and build mine shafts there, uh, which has led in some games to me having my colony and then having like a site B over here because whatever, like this is the only place I can collect clay uh, and I really need clay for bricks. And that leads to all sorts of other problems. Like, now my colonists have a long commute back and forth, but I really need this resource. And they're a fishman. So I need to maybe station my, uh, station one squad of my redcoats along the way. 
or maybe I want to start developing in that direction so there are more buildings for them to run into when they're being attacked. Um, I, it's, it's a welcome bit of complexity and uh, more realistic in terms of simulation and it makes you value uh, the resources you can successfully extract. Um, what else is there? Uh, there are also, uh, so all sorts of new events, like there's foreign intervention events related to uh, the foreign powers. Uh, there are even more options related to the way, uh, um, more, increasingly more compared to previous versions um, of fishman type events. So there were, there were events uh, that asked questions like, oh, you know, how do you want to deal with this fishman? He's trampling our crops, or they are driving our colonists crazy. Now there are also crazy uh, fishmen like to eat meat, and they're not picky about where it comes from. So if for some reason you have human corpses lying around, they will butcher and eat those, which understandably upsets your colonists, which creates a crisis event. Um, so that's a new ev new event for the fishmen. And you have the opportunity to reevaluate uh, <laughs> reevaluate your bilateral relations with the fishmen. Um, Oh, I have a report of a bandit camp. So there's bandits somewhere. Uh, we haven't found them. Right? My explored area is actually quite small. Oh, um, let's, okay, let's not provoke them. We'll, we'll only shoot at them if they come to steal our stuff, but this is a bandit event. Uh, a bandit wants to join our colony. I'll say, um, yeah, that's cool, you can join us. So, amusingly, a bandit from the newly spawned bandit camp has decided to uh, join us here in civilization. Bacchus Yake? That's quite the name. Yeah, he's just going to wander over. By the way, this is a bandit tent, and this floating weapon is being carried by a bandit who I cannot see, owing to the fog of war. Um, if I happen to... If I take the aggressive track with regards to bandits and wipe them all out and I'm able to successfully salvage their tents, they tend to have a lot of goodies. Um, and they tend to be random goodies, maybe things that I might not be able to produce, like bottles of booze and firearms and things. So, ban uh, Bacchus Yake is on his way here. Oh, it's very useful that he's actually going to tell us about all the land he explored on his way to my town. Uh, here's a malachite node. It will produce malachite ore, which can be refined into copper. So copper is also very useful. And then once I find, uh, speak of the devil, sphalerite nodes, which uh, produces sphalerite ore, which can be refined into tin. So uh, iron, copper, and tin in various combinations can produce steel and brass, um, which you can imagine is uh, useful in a situation set in uh, with a steampunk era technology. That's much farther down the line once I've built smelting and refining and general metal works. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna take the usual number of columns. So this has changed. It used to be uh, the usual number was always three, but now it's around two. I can, if I, if I really need extra colonists or don't want colonists, I can actually spend prestige, which I could do because I, I, I can afford um, either of these options, but I'm fine receiving the usual number of colonists. So, new guys in town, Bacchus Yake. Um, I'm going to assign Bacchus Yake here. And you'll see he immediately changes out of his bandit uh, garb into... Uh, into a sensible shirt and shoes. So there you go. So, uh, let's say this person's British and of criminal origin. He's already seated with some memories. He's, his mood is sad, but he at least he's, his morale is up. And uh, he's not insane, which is always a plus. Um, not likely to stay that way, sadly. Okay, so the kitchen's done. Let's queue up some food here. I have fungus and lingam berries in great abundance, so I'm going to say 
I'm gonna make a standing order. Always try to keep five fungus at all times. And again, if we look at this, one bushel of fungus produces two crates. So we will always look in the stockpile. Anytime um, there are fewer than five crates in the stockpile, I think is how it works, it will try and produce more. Let's do the same for lingonberry preserves and I've got a bunch of cabbage. Say, always try and keep three cabbage stew at hand. And um, I'm gonna say cook three birds. I don't have a, I don't have a steady or consistent supply of birds, so I'm just gonna say cook these three, right? And uh, then I'll expect the job to be completed. I can move them up and down the priority list, uh, which determines the order the the jobs get done, basically. Uh, yeah, and of course I need to assign a crew to the kitchen. There we go. That's telling me the kitchen needs a work crew, which I actually already did. So, um, when we assigned the crew to the carpentry, of course I changed all the all the filters flipped and then I changed them back. For the kitchen crew, I prefer to leave the filters as is because I want them to do nothing but cook and cook as quickly as possible at all times. So here we've got a man in the cooking crew, cooking a dodo. And uh, he's just taking birds out of the of the pile of birds. So it looks like only one, but actually this pile used to have three. And uh, while uh, while food is cooking, um, your, colony, your colonist doesn't just stand around waiting for it to finish cooking because cooking and then retrieving a cooked meal are two separate jobs. So he can set something to cook and then go do something else while it cooks, and then someone will go retrieve the cooked meal when it's done, um, which is quite cool. Uh, it didn't used to be that way, and that, that used to mean that the cooking crew would literally do nothing ever, because cooking is a big part of, uh, understandably a big part of keeping everyone f fed. Uh, new stuff. New stuff. Well. As you most likely saw, um, but I will demonstrate again, the blueprints, uh, they're now volumetric blueprints, which is just basically a minor aesthetic change, right? They used to be just a flat, like a piece of paper, and now they have a little bit of dimensionality to them. Not terribly significant in the grand scheme of things, but a nice little touch. Building a ceramics workshop here which is what will turn clay into bricks, which is very important for uh, building later. I'll just get this built for now. I don't, I'll build modules when the need arises. It'll just be an empty building. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, I'm sure I've forgotten some stuff. Uh, hopefully I'll cover it in subsequent episodes. Um, but that's, a very quick overview of what's new and uh, cool new stuff in the state of the game. Um, it's running very smoothly. Uh, the AI no longer, they've ironed out a lot of the really annoying bugs like the uh, retreat forever, standing in one place until you starve to death bug, and other bugs like uh, being chased by fishmen to the edge of the world until you reach the edge of the map and then you die bug. Uh, you know, that, that stuff is mostly gone now. I think the game is in a good, stable place and uh, ready to see uh, new expan uh, you know, expansion of content. Um, hopefully, uh, I'll be able to demonstrate some of the new, uh, new functionality in uh, episodes that follow this. So uh, I'm going to cut this one off here so it doesn't run too long. It's kind of longish already. Thanks very much for watching. Again, this is version 40 of Clockwork Empires. My name is Alfred. The game is in early development, available for purchase uh, through Steam and I believe the Gaslamp Games' own uh, website. Uh, yeah, and uh, this will be this is part one of maybe four or five episodes. Great. Have a good one.